Gates, chairman of Microsoft. Ten years ago, most computers weren't personal, and they certainly weren't sold in a computer store like this one. The introduction of the IBM PC, along with Microsoft's MS-DOS, has changed all of that. Today, over 70 million users are able to take advantage of the power of the PC to help get their work done. Before, every manufacturer had its own incompatible operating system. But today, over 200 manufacturers offer MS-DOS based systems that are fully compatible, providing users incredible freedom of choice. Visiting a computer store is a great way to see the variety that competition within the PC industry is providing, whether it's in printers or in systems. We have available low-cost systems, our very high-performance systems, our systems that are optimized to work in the network environment. This competition is also leading to a rapid pace of innovation. For example, this portable computer here, that's only seven pounds, is over ten times as powerful as the original PC. A key to such innovation is the improvement made in chip technology. The Intel microprocessor chips that are used in all these computers get over twice as fast every two years. So what this means is that during this decade, we'll have a computer that's even smaller than this one and yet provides over 10 times the speed while compatibly running all of the same software. The software industry has been transformed by the popularity of the personal computer. Today, software companies invest millions and millions of dollars writing packages that they can sell for only hundreds of dollars because of the large number of potential users. This has led to there being over 20,000 different packages that perform all variety of tasks. The rapid changes brought by the PC have definitely disrupted the business of traditional computer suppliers. We read all the time about how they're having to reorganize in order to meet the needs of this new market. But the key is that the beneficiary of all these changes are the users of these machines. The biggest change taking place in software is the move to the graphical environment. Microsoft made an early commitment to the graphical approach because we saw that it offered many significant benefits. One of those is making applications easier to learn because they all work the same way. Another is that you actually have less commands and you can see what's going on because you use pictures instead of text. You can see right on the screen exactly what you're going to get when you print your documents. And this is sometimes referred to as WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get. Another key point is the idea of integration, moving data easily between applications. We reached a major milestone in our Windows Crusade with the introduction of Windows version 3. We brought out Windows version 3 over 18 months ago, and it's really amazing that over 5 million copies have been sold. Windows version 3 was a breakthrough because it eliminated the memory barriers that Windows had had in the past. And with this success, we now have all the major software companies focusing their development work on writing Windows applications. What we've seen is that over a third of the packages being sold for DOS today 
are based on Windows. We sell a software development kit which helps people write these applications and over 60,000 of those have been purchased. Even more exciting is there's a new class of development tools that are even easier to work with that mean that not only professional software companies but actually companies themselves building applications for their own internal use will be able to build applications. But with this wave of applications and all these benefits we see that millions of users will be making the transition into the Windows environment. And so we've had to come up with some clever new ways to help support that transition. We're here at Microsoft's product support facility with one of our support engineers, Joe Long. Hi, Bill. The success of Windows 3 has really challenged our support group. Joe, how many calls do we get every day? We're getting about 2,500 calls a day, although we've noticed that this, it's been going down recently. We've more than doubled our staff to deal with this demand. I know we get a lot of uh, calls on different topics, but are there a few areas that it concentrates in? They call up how to get Windows set up and how to run it once it's running. The calls generally focus on printing, setup, networking, and running DOS-based applications. Well, when you have over five million users, you get an immense amount of feedback. And in fact, we're using that feedback in order to define the next release of Windows 3.1. It refines all the aspects of the product to make it even easier to use. Joe has a pre-release version on his machine uh, let's let's take a look at this. Uh, show me the uh, new file manager. Okay, here it is. Um, the file manager has some improvements over the uh, 3.0 file manager. You can view more than one directory at a time, and it's much much faster. And let's also uh, show how we put a new drag and drop facility in. You can drag a document onto an application, and it'll start that application with that document running. Another thing I'm, I'm excited about is this addition of TrueType to make uh, working with fonts a lot easier. Uh, can we go ahead and, and increase the size of that and, and show off the TrueType? Sure, let's change this non-TrueType font to a very large size, such as 72, and take a look and see what it looks like. Okay, so that's, that's without TrueType. Let's pick a, a TrueType font and see how it looks with that. Okay, we'll pick... A Times New Roman, size 72, much better. Okay, so TrueType actually makes those things look, uh, look good at, at any size. Another thing that I think is very exciting is this uh, uh, application integration through object linking and embedding. Uh, can we see an example of that? Sure. I'll just take a picture from the file manager and drag it into the right document and here it is. That means we can double click on this icon to view the picture or to change it and it starts up paintbrush, puts us in paintbrush and here's the picture. And Now we can change it however we like. And we go back, we save the changes and the changes are made to this icon right here. So all, all you have to do to get back to that those changes is double click right there and it'll, it'll take you there? Exactly. Oh, and here we are. That's great. Now this facility of embedding data of different types allows us to move into the area of multimedia. Uh, so another thing we're seeing in this document is the ability to put a sound in. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's go ahead and, and double click the microphone and, uh, and see what happens. Okay. Another crucial area for us has been working on robustness. A lot of people with working with Windows find that when an application has a problem, they get the unrecoverable application error and they have to shut the whole system down. What we've done in 3.1 is make it so only the application that has the problem has to be shut down. And this makes it a lot easier to, to go on working with the system. We want to demonstrate that to you with the test application that was designed to actually trigger an error. So let's go ahead and, and fire that up. Okay, it's called blow up. All we do is we choose what kind of error we want. We'll choose a general protection fault. The application will crash. Wait a few seconds. 
there, application error. And then we click on close, and Dr. Watson comes up. Now, Dr. Watson is a facility to log all the details about the error. So if you want to uh, call up product support and find out exactly what was going on, it, it makes it so you have a, a full set of data. Correct. It takes a picture of what the system looked like and saves it in a file for us. Fantastic. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Another key way that Microsoft designs its new products is by having what we call a usability lab, where we bring in users and watch them respond. This is one of Microsoft's usability laboratories. We bring users in with different levels of skills and expose them to our products well before we ship them. Now this results in lots and lots of changes, sometimes to the overall design and sometimes to things as small as the prompt text or the terminology that we use. Overall, it's made a big impact in our ability to deliver easy to use products. One of the products that we're testing today is called Pen Computing for Windows. The idea is that hardware manufacturers will be building PCs that include a touch sensitive surface. In fact, this is a prototype machine that NCR has already built. You use a pen right here on this surface, and you can handwrite just like you would on paper, and the computer recognizes it. So you don't have to use a keyboard. A machine like this could be taken into a meeting or out on a sales call and used in a very natural way. We're making sure that it's easy for people to work with Windows for pen computing. Let's go ahead and take a look at what this product is going to be like. I've got Byron Bishop, who's the lead engineer for our development effort. Hello, Bill. Let's go ahead and uh, uh, show a demonstration of the, the PEM windows. We're starting out here in the notebook app, and all we have to do is click on the calendar tab to move to the calendar page. To select a particular date, we just point to it, and so let's look at February 7th. So I can see my schedule, and for example, if I want to draw in a map, for this dinner appointment I have, I just scribble right there on the screen. And you can see it saves the ink that we put on it. Also, it's very easy to enter a new appointment. We simply use normal handwriting. And as soon as we're done, the computer recognizes that text. We also have what are called gestures that, that provide commands. For example, if we want to delete an appointment, we just strike through it. That's one of the easy-to-remember gestures. Or if we want to take that text and move it somewhere else, we use the insert gesture. Over here on this to-do list, we can go ahead and add in uh, a reminder that we want to write a memo. So that's working with the calendar. Now we'll go back to the index page and indicate that we want a blank sheet of paper. And what we're going to show on this is entering a diagram that shows the relationship of the different parts of pen windows. Well, we start by putting in some text, and it immediately recognize, recognizes that. Down at the bottom, we'll put some other text to show that how Windows is there. And over on the right, we're going to put the, the pen extensions. One of the interesting things is that we recognize not only the text, but also shapes that you draw. So for example, if we draw a little square around this text, even if we don't do it quite right, it knows that we want a square, and you can see it, it makes it perfect. At the top, let's use a circle, and we can see it recognizes that as well. Then we can connect these things together, and even though we don't draw our lines perfectly, it knows we want a straight line, and so it recognizes that. A key element of this pen computing is handwriting recognition. Now, everyone has handwriting that's a little bit different. So we've designed it so that it adjusts to your particular handwriting. As an example, let's go ahead and enter T-H-I-S, this. But we connected the T and the H. And so you can see that it didn't recognize it properly. Now, what we can do is train it that we often write it that way. And so we, we bring up a trainer and simply pick the letters we want to train in, write them properly, and ask it to remember uh, those shapes. 
So as soon as that's done, we can go back, and this time, if we do exactly the same writing, you can see that it recognizes it properly. Another thing that's really great about uh, these pen extensions is they allow you to use existing applications. To illustrate that, what we've done is used our Visual Basic development product and take just one hour to write a little data entry application. We'll click on the icon to bring it up and you can see it's a nice simple form. We can show how the pen works very well with selections like the list box here uh, and it also works very well when you enter in numbers. In this application we've told it that's a numeric field so it, it's even easier to recognize since it knows that there's just numbers going in. When we fill out the name on the ship to field, it goes ahead and looks that up in the database and is able to fill in the rest of this form. So all it needs is my actual signature, so I'll just go down to the bottom and sign like I normally would, and it's right there as part of the form. The send button will send that off so that the order is processed immediately. I hope this gives you a sense of how pen computing will expand the number of places that the personal computer is a valuable tool. Looks really great, Byron. Well, thank you, Bill. Another exciting extension to Windows is the multimedia set of extensions. These will add sound and motion video and bring Windows into another set of advanced applications. Multimedia applications will be important for business users, home users, and users in education. I've asked Nikki Mixcog, a product manager from our multimedia group, to come show us some examples. Hi, Bill. What we have here is I'm working in a Word document, and I've come to some information I'm not quite clear on, in particular, the ear. I'd like to find out how it works. So I can select the word, use a macro that I've already created, and load up a new application called Multimedia Bookshelf for Windows. I can then type in the word that I'm trying to look up, the information on the ear. Now you can see that Multimedia provides animations with sound capabilities to better help you understand that information. The human ear consists of outer, middle, and inner parts. The outer ear includes the auricle, the auditory canal, and the eardrum, or tympanic membrane. I can even take the information in this encyclopedia, copy it into my Word document using the copy command, and switching back over to my Word document and pasting it into the application. That's really great. The machine we're using here is a Tandy Multimedia Personal Computer. It's like a normal personal computer, except that the capability to make sounds and a CD-ROM reader has been added. So what we're doing is putting in normal CD disks that are the same as you use in an audio application. Now, buying a multimedia PC is only one way to get at these capabilities. You can also buy add-ons for normal PCs to provide those extensions, bringing it up to the level of the multimedia PC. The encyclopedia is a good example of how you'd use this in business. Let's look at one other example which is more appropriate for education. Do we have our Beethoven disc? Yes we do Bill. I'll go ahead and put it in the PC and load it up. This application was created by a music professor, Robert Winner, who wanted to teach the student about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. He's made it very interesting by including all the different elements that multimedia is capable of. We can start out by clicking on the pocket guide. And this shows that the symphony is divided into four movements. And it makes it easy to select in and, and listen to any of the different parts so we can compare them. For example, we can click on the joy theme that's late in the fourth movement. Another part of this is called a close listening. 
it lets you go and learn about instruments and music at the time of the Ninth Symphony. Let's go to the page that talks about the woodwinds. It has an example here where we can hear the sound of an oboe. Another section takes interesting parts of the music and describes for you the musical technique that Beethoven is using to make it particularly impactful. The section we move to here talks about the use of dotted rhythms in Beethoven's Defiance theme. So we can click and listen and even see in the score the different notes that are being played. This piece takes the Ninth Symphony and makes it fun, makes it approachable for the student. Now multimedia is just one of the ways that we're extending windows. Another important extension we're making is taking windows and making it work better with networks. We're finding more and more of our users want their windows machines to sit on the network and allow them to get out to the world of information. Here at Microsoft, all of our Windows PCs are connected to a worldwide network. This brings together our 40 different United States locations, as well as our 24 locations outside the US. It's over 14,000 different PCs connected and using applications that help us run our business. At headquarters, we use a 100 megabyte fiber backbone and we connect the rest of the world using leased lines. One of the important applications we run on this network is called Worldwide Sales. It gives people an instant look at how our sales are doing compared to forecast. I'd like to show that application to you. Before we had this application, we distributed our, our sales data, like a lot of companies do, on paper. So people always received uh, information they weren't interested in, and they didn't get the detail that might be particularly relevant to them. Now we've eliminated the use of that paper reporting altogether. There's simply an icon sitting right here on your desktop that you just point to and click whenever you're interested in this worldwide sales data. Now we have this hooked up with security, so only the people who should have access to the right parts of the database can get at it. So the first thing I do to get connected is type in my, my password. Then what it's doing is going out to the server that holds this information in our network. It gives me a choice of exactly what data I want to pull up. So let's say I want to see all the sales data for this particular month. It's using the network sending out a query, and now we can see the results uh, for every one of these business units. Whenever you want to dive down and see detail, it's simply a matter of pointing and clicking. So let's take the applications group here, point to that, and drill down to see the more detailed information. Very quickly, we see now the results by business unit. And we can see a couple of the business units are doing very well compared to plan, and a couple are not on plan. Now, if I want to see this data in different forms, I can simply take it and use Windows Clipboard and copy all the information into that. So then I can switch over and use the Excel spreadsheet. And as soon as I paste this data in, it's available to format in any way that I'd like. For example, I can take part of this data and simply hit a key and then see a chart that lets me see the underlying trends in that data. So now we've eliminated the printed reports and given people incredibly more flexibility over how they want to look at this data. Microsoft has 18 different applications we use now that take advantage of the network to help us run our business more efficiently. These include things like expense tracking or keeping track of our product development schedules. So all I have to do is go in and click an icon to see exactly where everything stands. Even the bug database 
is tracked using the large network. Now the worldwide sales application only required PCs. The PC on the desktop and a large PC running our SQL server back end with all of the, the sales information. But a number of these applications tie into the different types of computers on the network. For example, our overseas subsidiaries all have AS400s that are used for order entry and invoicing. And the many of the applications tie Excel as a front end as a window onto that AS400 data. We also have a number of deck VAXs we use here at headquarters for our accounting information. So it's a heterogeneous network, but the end user only has to know Windows and be able to point and click to take full advantage of these applications. In fact, there are a total of over 500 different servers connected to this network. Here we are in the computer room that holds all of our server machines. Here we see the PC server machines of which we have over 500. These machines are based on the 386 and the 486, and they have up to 20 gigabytes of storage. Now the software we run on these machines includes our LAN manager and our mail server, as well as the SQL database product. Today we've been running most of these machines under the OS2 operating system, but we're preparing a new product, our Windows NT product, that's even more advanced that we'll be using on these machines in the future. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Windows NT product. I have it running in its early form on this machine here. Windows NT stands for Windows New Technology, and it's a major advance in the power of Windows. It also represents our approach to doing more powerful software, which is to maintain compatibility. You could call this the evolutionary approach. Instead of revolutionizing things and forcing people to give up, the investments they've made in learning and applications, we simply improve what's there with compatibility. So Windows NT runs all the same DOS and Windows applications that have been built in the past while providing extra power. We can see that NT provides exactly the same appearance as Windows 3.1. We're starting out here with the program manager in the back, which is of course the same. And we also have the file manager that lets us go through our directories, makes it easy to run applications. In fact, I'll just double click here and bring up the, the clock application. That's not all I've got running here. If I bring these down into iconic form, you'll see there's dozens of tasks already running, many of them demonstrating the advanced features that this NT operating system will have. These include the uh, more powerful graphics, as well as the multitasking capability that includes threads and advanced security. One of the concepts that we feel is important is to support advanced processor architecture. This includes both having multiple processors for symmetric multiprocessing, as well as supporting RISC-type processors. These approaches will allow people to have servers that go way beyond what's available today. And in fact, they'll even bring higher performance down to the desktop. Because we're implementing the same applications interface on our Windows NT product as we will with our Windows on DOS product, we call this a scalable operating system. And Windows is the first product to use this approach. It means that applications can run the same way no matter whether you pick Windows on DOS or Windows NT. Now the key to the Windows NT success will be making it easy to move it into your computing environment. We've done that with applications compatibility, but we've also done it with the way we allow it to work on the network. Windows NT will have available our LAN manager product, and it will use the, exactly the same protocols, so it will interoperate with LAN manager running on top of OS2. 
In fact, in the computer environment that Microsoft uses, we'll be able, able to bring up Windows NT server by server without ever interrupting our network environment. Ten years ago, we began work with IBM on their first personal computer. In the years that followed, we worked together on hardware and software improvements. For over six years, we worked together to develop OS2 as a replacement for MS-DOS. As it turned out, OS2 had significant limitations. We, we believe that Windows is more appropriate for the desktop and will dominate in that segment of the market. OS2 will continue to have a limited role as a server operating system and for specialized segments of the market. Microsoft is fully licensed to OS2 and will continue to support our customers and license it to OEMs. We are very committed to helping users who have done OS2 development work to migrate to Windows and Windows NT, including providing an OS2 compatibility layer so applications written for OS2 will move over to Windows NT. Our goal at Microsoft is to expand personal computing and help empower individuals with powerful, easy-to-use computers. I call our vision for this environment information at your fingertips. It's a vision for moving PCs to a more user-oriented view, where users think about data and information instead of applications and configuration files. We are already far along in extending and advancing Windows on DOS and Windows NT, both with object-oriented functionality, not only in the user interface, but also in the file system and programming model. Combined with transparent information access, this will be a huge step towards information at your fingertips. Our strategy can be summarized in one word, Windows. We're working hard to improve the base product, and Windows 3.1 out will be out in the near future. We're also far along on the extensions for pens and multimedia, and those will also ship in the near future. During 1992, Windows NT will take Windows into a high-end environment by adding advanced capabilities. Most importantly, all of these extensions will be evolutionary. They will continue to leverage the investments that you're making in training and applications. Finally, our Windows strategy is based upon openness in the PC tradition. Hundreds of hardware companies will continue to build state-of-the-art PCs that run both Windows and Windows applications. This means that choice and competitive prices will continue through the next decade as we bring new technology to you. I hope this video has helped to clarify our strategy for the next decade of personal computing. Microsoft is dedicated to making personal computing easier and more productive for you. I think the next 10 years will be even more exciting than the past. Thank you for spending this time with me.